Thanks for the introduction, Simon. I'm delighted to be interviewing Professor Sir Partha Dasgupta, a man who will need no introduction for those interested in the economics of biodiversity. Professor Dasgupta has received degrees from the University of Delhi and the University of Cambridge. He is Frank Ramsey, Emeritus Professor of Economics at the University of Cambridge, Fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge, and Professorial Research Fellow at the Sustainable Consumption Institute at the University of Manchester. Professor Dasgupta's research interests have covered welfare and development economics, the economics of technological change, population, environmental and resource economics, the theory of games, the economics of undernutrition, and the economics of social capital. This year saw the publication of the Dasgupta Review, an independent global review on the economics of biodiversity. It called for changes in how we think, act, and measure economic success to protect and enhance the prosperity in the natural world. But not from me. Professor Dasgupta, I want to thank you for taking the time and know what you think and know what you think of the reaction to the review. Do you think any tangible progress has been made since the publication in February? Very early to say. This is just about four months since the review was launched. Uh, there's been a great deal of interest, enormous amount of interest, but there is a sense in which the interest has been um, generated by people who are already concerned about humanity's treatment of the biosphere. So there's been some self-selection. It's too early to say uh, what the final impact is going to be, but the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Treasury is preparing a response to the review, uh, working with some members of my team. And until that is published, we won't quite know how far it is reaching uh, policy making. Did you think perhaps the media reaction was focusing on the right aspects? Obviously, it's a very long review that is difficult to submit in short articles. Yeah, I, I, I thought the media coverage was very good. Um, on the other hand, I'm not really very experienced in this. So it may be that because I saw it for the first time, it impressed me a lot. My, my work usually is published in technical journals read by about five people uh, and so forth. But this one, of course, has a much greater coverage. But I've been very, very pleased. Yes, it's, been, it's had good reviews, uh, intelligent reviews, uh, perceptive reviews in, in newspapers and magazines. No, it really seemed to dominate the conversations I was having for um, that month. It was um, really brought biodiversity to the forefront. And I think what, one thing that comes across from the review strongly is that credible, credible economics should be supported by credible ecology. Why do you think economists have overlooked nature for so long? I think it's partly that, that most people have. Ecology is a really relatively new science, a lot newer than economics even. And uh, although enormous progress has taken place in ecology in trying to understand the processes that guide the uh, ecosystems, whether it's wetlands or coral reefs or mangrove forests, um, economists haven't really caught up with it, partly because it's a new subject, new discipline, and economists typically aren't uh, trained in that field. Uh, we are trained in mathematics. Uh, many come from physics, not quite in uh, macro biology, where the unit of being studied is ecosystems. But there's nothing intrinsically difficult about bringing ecology into economic reasoning and mo modeling. Uh, I found it to be relatively, uh, I won't say simple, but no more difficult than uh, understanding, say, the steel industry. Uh, and so it's really a matter of habit, and I hope very much the review will uh, will will make people in my 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 uh, my colleagues take interest in it and study ecology. It's not a great subject. I mean, it's a greatly difficult subject. It's got uh, wonderful textbooks. After all, I had to learn it myself. Mm. Uh, so others can do it too. Is there something about the nature of biodiversity which makes it very difficult for economists and their traditional models to incorporate and understand? Well, it, the, the real, the real the essential problem is that nature is underpriced. A lot of nature comes free. So, so the goods and services nature provides, the biosphere provides, uh, go undetected in economic uh, 
statistics. So if something is undetected, you're hardly likely to want to understand what's going on because you don't quite know what's going on. You see? So it's very easy to ignore it. So fundamental problem is nobody, we are not really paying a price for the stuff that we use, which is coming in seamlessly being provided by an agent, all sorts of things. Neat pollination is one we talk about now, but decomposition of waste, uh, the uh, uh, nitrogen fixation, and of course, carbon regulation or climate regulation is the one which is studied a great deal. The problem is that that regulation is related to all the other uh, ac services that nature provides. So isolating uh, you know, concentrating on one at the expense of all others is extremely dangerous because they're not independent of each other. In fact, they're complementary to each other. So if one of them really goes down because you're really degraded in nature, many other things will follow. So it's really not having a record of what we are doing to nature, except for people on the ground, they get uh, ignored. No, that's an interesting way of looking at, looking at it. And I guess then maybe to take the discussion away from the economists' um, models and projections. One criticism of economic studies is that translating like new economic consensus into policy actions um, is the next step, and that has to happen. I'd be particularly interested in the, what you see the role of the finance sector uh, must play in the next few years to stop the disruption of our natural world. What do they need to know from your reports, and what are the next steps that you want to see over the coming years? That's a very, very good question and a very difficult one. So I'll disappoint your <laughs> audience <laughs> inevitably. Um, let's look at the ideal scenario. What is it that we think would be an ideal socio-ecological world? It'll be one in which institutions are in, pla are in place such that the incentives each of us has given our personal motivations, our concerns, and the constraints we face will lead us to take actions which taken together are consonant with the common good. That's the ideal, okay? Individuals will be choosing, they'll be not told what to do, but the environment will be such, you know, the social environment will be such that their best actions, best chosen actions will be consonant with the common good. Now, that ideal is we are far away from it, so far that we, that we are really trashing nature. And one reason is that, of course, nature, as I mentioned earlier, uh, nature is underpriced, in many cases free, and in some cases, in fact, in uh, disturbingly large numbers of cases, it comes with a negative price because we, are, uh, we, we, we subsidize nature. We subsidize our use of nature, so it comes with a negative price. So it's even worse than zero price, okay? Something like four to six trillion US dollars per year is the subsidy. If you take that, that's a, one of the uh, estimates that we have in the review. So naturally we want not to economize on cheap factors of production. Goes without saying, that's why we, and, and so because it's negative price or zero price, we eat into it. Okay, so how does, how do things change? Well, one, of course, the standard story will be put a price on them, on the stuff which has zero price, lift the, lift the subsidies and then impose prices. The question arises, who imposes the prices? Given the fact that much of nature is really a public good, common property, like the atmosphere, the open oceans. So the signals that um, the financial sector faces in terms of prices are wrong. So you can't really blame the financial sector per se. It's easy to become extremely moralistic about it. But the world is, is we all are given, we are all socially embedded, it goes without saying, but up to a point we have to look after our own interests and our own remits. So the, the weakness lies in our, not so much as in people and agencies, but on institutions, the fact that the institutions are wrong. So what can be done? Well, it depends on what kind of problem you're looking at. If you look at the open oceans, for example, just like, take that as an example, beyond the 200 mile um, exclusive economic zones, we are using th that resource in a big way in terms of transportation. All the goods and services that cross the Atlantic and the Pacific are, are coming in for free. Nobody's paying for it, right? The, there's no rent for 
using the transport mechanism. Of course, there's cost of the transport, but that's a different matter. We're looking at the rent that could be charged. Uh, but we don't have an institution which charges for it, which would then limit our use of it and restrict the damage that we uh, inflict on the oceans. Uh, likewise with fisheries, ocean fisheries. So like, take, take, take that two classes of uh, activities. Uh, they're unpriced. Uh, you can't quite blame the financial sector for not recognizing that when it transports goods and services, it's actually damaging the uh, oceans, at least marginally. Okay. So one recommendation would be to have a in international institution in parallel with the World Bank and IMF, which would be would have the remit to charge for their use. Okay. Then that would be the kind of signal that the financial sector would have to economize on the use change the production technique. So that's one. A final one, the second one, and I'll stop there, would be over local ecosystems, way up in, say, Africa, Latin America, from which goods, primary products are imported and then transformed into goods and services sold in the markets here. Now, that entire chain has huge leaks because prices are imperfect. We need to do something about it. So one of the things we are the review comes rather hard on is that prices are likely to be, uh, it's not possible to have prices at every stage so that the profitability of, the, of an enterprise is, does not reflect the true cost, you know, true costs that are being imposed. And maybe regulations are required. Disclosure is the thing that we uh, go for. Namely, firms ought to have, be made to disclose their entire supply chain, what's happening in the supply chain, what the state of the ecosystems are and so forth. Uh, we do see disclosure a lot over food products these days because we care about our own health. Okay, so the content of food. So you now suppose we care about the ecosystems, we care about the biosphere, we consumers, we uh, uh, should be, would wish to know what it is that has happened to the biosphere uh, in the process of production of the goods we are buying. Okay. So we, the review goes into some length at that. So it's one of those things where I think it will be in the interest of firms to insist on that, because if they don't, and, they, and then some, day, some years later, the consumer begins to worry a lot about these matters in the way they, we worry about our health, then we'll impose it anyway then. Will demand that it happens, and having a first mover advantage would be a good thing. So it could well be that tying one's hand is something that firms actually ought to insist on because their profitability will rise uh, if they're trashing their uh, sources of the products uh, because they're unrecorded. It's not going to be very good for their profitability in the long run. No, that's a really good overview, and I think. Um the fundamental message that it's about creating the correct regulatory environment to incentivize investment. That should be the first mover. I think that's a good message. I guess then maybe that moves responsibility onto international regulators, national regulators. Is there something that you think investors should be doing more of now before these new regulations come in in the future? I would think so. There's some advantage. You see, there's a risk on, on both ends. That is to say, if a firm on its own decides to become very ethical, let's call it that, just for the sake of argument, um, because, ethical because it's doing something not quite in its current interest given the price structure, but it wants to anticipate problems. There's a risk because initially there may be no, there may be some losses in profit initially. Okay. On the other hand, it's forestalling difficulties in the future, particularly given that if it's a first mover, its reputation will be increased. So there's an advantage of that. Now, I, I can't, as an academic, tell a firm what it's in its best interest, but you can see there are two uh, forces at work. On the one hand, you want to get away with the cheap products out there. You don't have to pay. That's great. <laughs> Profits are high. On the other hand, if you were not to do that, to take, to, some, you know, to, to take a voluntary action, then your reputation will go up, and then later uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, customers will regard you as, if, 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 as the place to go to. For, for their products. So on the other hand, if the firms get together and say, look, we do need some uh, uh, discipline because we're not paying for the stuff 
and it's hurting it's, it's hurting us in the long run or even the medium run because our primary product may be at at at, at risk okay as as the ecosystems de degrade out there because we're not controlling them uh, and then our dealings with foreign governments is also extremely important because you know we mustn't constantly think in terms of the predatory company in the West. There are predatory governments sitting <laughs> on top of very very delicate ecosystems. Okay, so I mean I think it's a it's a, it's it's wrong to concentrate attention on the wicked capitalism. If you see what I mean, there's a lot of other things going on as well. And I think it'll be it'll be very very wise, bold, and I think uh, it'll be really very bold if firms actually take the lead and said, no, we are going to disclose, we are going to inform our customers as to what we are doing to protect the sources of our products. Okay. Now, it's easy for me to say that, but as customers get more and more informed about what we are doing to the biosphere, for example, if people start reading my review, uh, then, then they will be very worried about these matters as happening in distant shores. Um, then it'll be a it'll be a virtuous cycle. No, and I think you're right to highlight the role of government in this. They aren't just regulators; they are also financial players that have a stewardship role towards their ecosystems. Um, one thing which I've seen happening in the last few months since your review is a broader push towards integrating biodiversity into finance, um, which I think your report was a big catalyst, catalyst of. Um, so Pakistan, for example, has announced that it's planning a nature-linked sovereign bond, and more broadly, there's been talk of debt for nature swaps, which um, in the restructuring of emerging market debt. What are your thoughts on these types of very specific financial products um, designed to put a value on biodiversity? These are uh, exactly in line with the review, so of course I applaud it. Um, uh, of course, the devil uh, depends on the details, goes without saying, and I wouldn't be in a position to comment on that, but the sure. attitude is exactly right. Uh, although you should remember, the although the review is called the review of the economics of biodiversity, in a way it's a misnomer. Um, it's about the biosphere. Biodiversity is a characteristic of ecosystems. Okay. It's like characteristic of a portfolio. Suppose you have a financial portfolio. Somebody said, all right, you've got a portfolio. Tell me what's in it. <laughs> what, what kind of, what, what are the stocks in mm. it okay, in the portfolio? So it's the diversity of stocks in a portfolio which parallels biodiversity. An ecosystem has many, many processes running. There are communities of organisms are uh, interplaying with each other as well as the uh, non-living material flows in the mm. ecosystem, which is whether it's a pond or a lake or a coastal fishery or you name it. OK, um, and the, the basic understanding is that biodiversity, diversity of life, and that has to be very defined very precisely uh, in many cases, um, improves the productivity of the ecosystem in terms of the goods and services it produces, all the regulations, all the services that we enjoy implicitly for, for the production of food, timber, you name it, okay? So essentially it's a study of ecosystems. And so the, the review is really about valuing ecosystems and you value it by asking, what does it do? What is it producing? How much are we using it? And so forth, okay? And it will have use value, the value to our production activities. It will also have intrinsic value. Many of us care about nature just independently of what nature does for us, okay? Many, many processes are out there for which we actually voluntarily pay. So many NGOs, nature NGOs, which are essentially there to protect them in order to protect these uh, intrinsic values. And there are some which are even sacred values, so um, which have sacred value to various uh, communities. So the economics of bio, the biosphere, the title of the review really should be the economics, review of the economics of the biosphere. We're looking at a particularly gigantic capital asset like we, you know, like uh, economics of produced capital or economics of human capital, education, health, and so forth. This is about the biosphere. So it's really valuing ecosystems and what it does. The, and the value of ecosystems will be in terms of the processes and the goods and services the ecosystems are churning out. Okay. Um, so all these movements are designed for that. And one of the um, offshoots of this would be 
for example. It's a very simple economics. Uh, many of them are supplying goods which are enjoyed by the whole of the global community. These are, we'll call them global public goods, like the atmosphere. It circulates. So if I contaminate the atmosphere here, eventually it'll find its way somewhere else. <laughs> Spread, okay. All right. Likewise, the open oceans are global public goods. Likewise, the rainforests, tropical rainforests, or uh, the peatlands. They're huge uh, assets sitting out there. The former, the first two, open oceans and the atmosphere, are owned by nobody. No, and so they are called open access resources. And of course, they're extremely vulnerable to uh, con contamination because nobody pays for it, everybody uses it, and it's overused. Okay. In the case of the latter, peatlands and the uh, rainforest, they fall within political jurisdictions. <laughs> so in some sense, let's make it crude. They own it. Countries own it. Yeah. And yet, of course, supplying a global public good. So you can see the difference. In the first case, I was suggesting an international organization will be charged to charge rents on their use. Here, uh, the natural thing would be to subsidize these countries to protect these assets because they're supplying a public good. They claim that they have an incentive to destroy it because for, for economic development and so forth. You don't need to necessarily believe that, by the way, but yeah. let's suppose they're correct. So it should be some kind of a bargaining here to say, well, all right, how much will you charge? We'll let's negotiate uh, the, the rest of society, the world. So it's a, it's a, these are not difficult things to conceive of because elementary economics is telling us, driving the, driving us in that direction. Uh, we, what we need to do is to be bold to think through problems we haven't thought about before. Having said that, finally, we have thought about how to handle global public goods. Uh, aviation industry is relying on enormous amount of agreement across nations as to air, you know, uh, the right of passage across the airspace and so forth, or the use of um, uh, airwaves and so forth. So it's not as though we haven't gone into that territory. It's just that we haven't gone into the biospheric uh, goods and services, which are so underpriced. No, I think um, that's really interesting. And I think in your context of um, nature being a public good, which perhaps some nations should be subsidized for the protection of, particularly if they can use it for their economic um, well-being. I guess in that context, what do you make of the Brazilian government's demands for international financial assistance in order to seize the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest? Because I know that's proved controversial among some environmental campaigners. No, I, I, I was trying to, uh, I think I sort of anticipated uh, this issue in my previous answer or response. I think it's exactly right. We should be thinking along those lines because the fact is that they, under, under our understanding of national sovereignty. Uh, the rainforests are within national jurisdiction. And it's no good sitting outside and bleating about the fact that the rainforests are disappearing. And isn't it awful? Uh, it is awful. It's absolutely horrible uh, what's happening. But at the end of the day, what needs is a negotiation with those governments to come to terms as to what, what transfers are required in order to prevent them from doing that. Now, of course, people will be, there'll be huge conflict of interest here. Uh, the, uh, the, the countries which house the peatlands and the uh, rainforest will be saying that, you know, uh, without, without deforesting, you know, we are going to collapse, we, we need complete support and so forth and so on. But that's, that's the, it's the usual problem in bargaining, goes without saying that. If we stop from thinking along these lines, we are in for it, <laughs> let's face it, because the tropical rainforests are really are suffering. It's not just Brazil, it's also Indonesia, it's Malaysia, and you know, and in the, in the Congo, uh, it's a serious stuff, but and we just need to accept the fact that simple economics, it's nothing to do with the review, by the way, <laughs> the simple economics says, yes, some transfer payments is required to compensate for their perceived loss in output as a result of keeping uh, these public goods intact. So the but, immediacy of the emergency kind of trumps any kind of principles, as it were. 
Yes, I think so. I mean, it's, this is this is not controversial economics. It, it the terrain in which this economics is being used is not familiar, and that's why we mm. we are repelled by it. It's, you know, that's the psychological repugnancy. You know? Why we have to pay them to keep these rainforests? Ask ask we. The answer <laughs> is yes. <laughs> the town town thing is a global public good. <laughs> Likewise, we ought to be paying for the right to send huge ships with cargo across the Pacific or the Atlantic. And somebody will say, well, this is outrageous. Why should we pay? And the answer is, it's a finite good and it's an open access resource and we are destroying it. It's the only way we can keep it from being destroyed is actually to make it expensive to use or, you know what, I mean, pay a price for it. Yeah. That's, this is not rocket science. It's not rocket economics. It's absolutely elementary first year economics, except the Examples are in areas we are unfamiliar with. No, that makes sense. I think I'll move on very swiftly because I know um, we're running out of time. And I think one area which your report em- review emphasized, um, which is very refreshing, was its emphasis on citizen investors who can pressure financiers to allocate their more money more sustainably. I guess I want to know on a practical level, what are the main challenges facing citizens who want to make sustainable decisions with their savings? Because there's a lot of choices on the market right now. Well, uh, this is a hard, impossibly uh, the long question to answer, but one of the first things we ought to do is to have a good bookkeeping device. Mm. Nations should have a better bookkeeping device, move away from GDP when talking about sustainable development, but think in terms of asset stocks. What are we leaving behind next at the end of the year as compared to what we inherited at the beginning of the year? Firms, private companies call that balance sheets. <laughs> Nations don't have balance sheets, and they should. We should know <laughs> what stocks we have, okay, countries have, you know, how much of fisheries, uh, you know, forest cover, the stuff that's inside the forest, uh, mangroves, mangrove forests, and so forth. Okay, we don't have that. So we need to move into that direction. And the reason that we need is because that it's, you know, information alerts us to difficulties, problems that we face. If there's no information, we just, we can't. So that's important, extremely important. Uh, and in the review uh, um, advocates the use of what we call inclusive wealth, that we should be studying the wealth of nations, not the income of nations. And movements in wealth over time is what we should be recording when we talk about uh, sustainable development. And that wealth should include natural capital, that is to say, ecosystems, if you like, just for the sake of argument as a simplification, not just what we have built in terms of roads and buildings and machines and how much how much additional education and healthcare and so forth again. Those are standard stuff in our economic models. Natural capital is missing and we need to incorporate that actually, literally. Um, so that helps guide companies. That kind of information guides, helps guide companies regarding what's on offer, what the terrain looks like. But that won't be enough. That's information about the, the character of stocks in this country elsewhere, and elsewhere in the entire supply chain. Suppose imagine all countries had inclusive wealth report, uh, records each year. Then companies would have a sense of what's out there. Um, the, from there being places from which you're importing goods and services, uh, or goods in particular. Uh, so that's important, but that's not enough because you need a pricing structure. You need to be able to pay for it. Uh, and that, that brings us back to the previous questions that you asked. So I think we have to move in, and it really a lock stock change in the institutional, institutional framework in which uh, we operate uh, as economies. Uh, because, and it all stems from the fact that nature is missing from economic accounts and economic reasoning, and that's disastrous. Thank you. That's a very good answer. And I think just one more very briefly, maybe 30 seconds. I mean, um, looking ahead, we've got the United Nations Conference on Biodiversity later this year, and then the one on climate change in Glasgow. What are the main policy developments that you want to see there that you can end this year 2021 and think yes we're on the right track we're making good progress well in many ways it's implicit in the our entire discussion as to what i'd like to see but that's not going to happen i think the first the thing i would like to see most is the one which is least likely to see the light of day 
which is a serious a beginnings of a discussion of having an international institution like the World Bank, like the IMF, like WHO, which were founded with a view to solving problems of global public goods. That's what the World Bank is about. That's what the uh, IMF is about. But none, neither of them is concerned with directly with managing the global commons. Uh. And we need something desperately for managing the global commons. But I rather doubt if it's on the agenda of uh, COP15. It should be, uh, but that's what I'd like to see best. Well, thank you. We can hope. <laughs> um, but thanks so much for your time, Professor Desgupta. This has been really informative, and I'm sure everyone who's watching has learned a lot, as so I certainly have. Um, we're moving on to the next session now, but I want to thanks again to, to, to Professor Desgupta for making the time, and um, thanks also for watching. <laughs>